possible that this is a very different kind of exhibition. I'm a historian that typically writes articles that few people read and books that rarely are consulted. So this is a very different um, challenge for Rebecca and I. We we created a an exhibition. We began work on this in the 2015. Um, in the ideation process, it was first delivered to an audience here at the gardens in summer of 2017. And it's now in its seventh and final stop in Mississauga. So it's had a very long run for a temporary exhibition or a traveling show, and we're thrilled with that. And I think if it's had success, it's because it treats history in ways that are r relatively innovative. So Rebecca will go into the wonderful partnerships and collaborators, the, the artists who took part in this exhibition. But from a historian's point of view, my challenge was to try and be succinct, which is a challenge for some of us, um, to do this in a bilingual fashion because we were speaking to an audience in Quebec that had to have both official languages. So that is also another need to be very uh, short uh, and, and brief, but also to explore the extraordinary complexity of the of World War I story um, and to do it in ways which would attract people. Um, on the one hand, the descendants of the family, George Stephen Cantley, who is the the lead and primary figure to some extent in the exhibition to those who for whom the First World War means nothing whatsoever. So it's a challenge between um, speaking to those who know the story uh, top to bottom, beginning to end in its intimate detail um, to those for whom the First War is so far distant. I remember we began this in 2015, it opened in 2017. This was sort of the beginning of the book ending of the First War celebrations. We were in the in the moment where Canada and other nations were commemorating the first war and the, the last of the survivors. So we were trying to do something which was not being done at other venues, which were typically um, somewhat glorifying war. They were talking about the great figures and the heroes. They were also displaying uh, guns and armaments. They were talking about the battles. We were trying to deal with this extraordinarily complex story in a very Canadian way, which was fairly open and democratic and accessible to various audiences. We did make a number of choices. They were tough ones. We chose 10 historical figures, men and women, uh, local, not local, French and English, but it wasn't meant to be a portrait of the Canadian war story. It was really, to some extent, the story of, of, of one region's or one province's um, response to the war and the way in which the war intersected with a number of lives, uh, both during the war and then afterwards, because a number of these characters then intersect in very interesting ways. Um, so it's a very, it was a very challenging experience for a historian to be brief, to be succinct. It was the fruit of many, many months of research, a number of visits to France and Belgium to see the battlefields for ourselves. It was a lot of work with um, people who know the story better than better than either of us, um, historians and people at the Canadian War Museum in particular. Um, but I think we kind of um, made the mark, and indeed, as Libba said, when you tour the exhibition, you leave with certainly a greater awareness of what the war meant. So maybe a tear in your eye, maybe a maybe a, a reflective moment, but certainly you don't leave the exhibition uh, um, distant. You really, I think, feel connected to the stories of these extraordinary people, and that really is the combination, I think, of words, of photographs, of of artistry of the extraordinary glass sculptures by Mark Rains Roberts, of the olfactory component, and primarily, frankly, the the, the extraordinary imagination that Viveka, the creator of this exhibition, brought to the approach. It wasn't my approach. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a typical mainline history exhibition. It really is a very intertwined and complex narrative that reads almost like a film experience. So, so bravo to Viveka. She can tell you a little bit more about the uh, process that brought her to the point of creating a rather, rather, rather unique narrative. So if you don't mind, Elizabeth, I'm going to take uh, take people through a couple of slides here um, and um, do encourage you to tell me to, to pull them up and shut up so that the back. <laughs> You're take doing over. great. Sure. So I'm hoping you can see the screen here. Can you use that coming up? Not yet. Not yet, okay. No. Um, you should be able to share content. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. I 
it's funny. It's like no matter how many times, every single talk I've been on. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So here we are in the extraordinary, beautiful building in Mississauga, the Living Arts Center. A very difficult venue, frankly, to show a small show. It's a giant, enormous space, not dissimilar, frankly, from the challenge that Vivek and Norma and the team faced in uh, the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. It was built, uh, it must be said, for different venues. The Esteban Lodge at the Gardens is an 1886 building with very low ceilings and wood paneling. So everything had to fit in a tight space, uh, just as it did in Toronto at the Campbell House Museum, uh, just as well as it has to fit in this enormously, wonderfully open atrium space at the Living Arts Centre in Mississauga. So challenge from a design perspective. And the idea, of course, was to give in these big spaces a chance to view things in a very intimate basis. So here you have just um, an example of the kind of engagement that was sought after by Viveka and the design team, which is to not just read the, the exhibition panels, which are um, remarkably brief and, and uh, poetic in their, in their brevity, but also I think to connect to the story and the story being told in the various narrative panels. The story begins with a number of letters. So, so the, the, the war flowers uh, premise that Viveka can, can, can explain with greater detail began with the discovery, um, accidental by choice, by, by fate, by happenstance, by connection, of this extraordinary collection of, of surviving documents from the First World War era. These are letters sent by George Stephen Cantley, Cantley who was a Scottish family, uh, second generation Montrealers, uh, George Stephen Cantley sent letters back home to his family in Montreal. For this one, you'll see Bic, Quebec is the beautiful little town about 100 kilometers from here. Alexander? Uh, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, is there a way you can make the slides full screen so we can see of course the I can, yeah. detail? Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yay. Sorry, sorry about that. So here no, you see that's a good okay. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, a unique letter in which Cantley is writing to his youngest of five children, Celia, uh, in Bic, Quebec. She's then holidaying. And there you have um, the the Flanders poppy that was picked by George Stephen Cantley in the battlefields of France or Belgium to send home to his his darling wee Celia, which was the premise for a lot of the explorations that this uh, exhibition then demonstrates. So Cantley was a, a lifetime warrior. He was a kind of a weekend warrior, joined the, the um, militia in Montreal at the age of 14 and was associated with the Black Watch Montreal for a remarkable 71 years. And at age uh, 48, he joined up to lead the Black Watch of Montreal to the battlefields of France. So he is illustrative of a Canadian um, who believes deeply and strongly in the need to contribute to the first war effort and does so at great sacrifice, but, mar uh, but survives the war in contrast to many of the soldiers that he took over with him. Uh, he is, uh, he's pulled back from the front uh, in the middle of the war and ends up managing reserve battalion, but Cantley is, remains very much a figure of the Black Watch for the duration of his very long and fruitful life. He dies in Montreal in 1956. And, and Cantley was the kind of entrance point, the portal, maybe the story that that leads people through this exhibition because the flowers are this unique um, evidence of, of a man's extraordinary need to provide his own family with emotional sustenance during the first war period. He survives, but many of his Canadian colleagues did not. But he was very cognizant of the fact that he's an unusual soldier because he's got many children. Many, many, many other soldiers had no family yet, but he was very aware of their need to know that their father was alive and surviving the war. There you see him here in his, in his full kit, um, striking, uh, erect um, man of fastidious uh, um, fashion and a, and a man for whom uh, his fellow soldiers had enormous and great admiration. And there you see that same image that was blown up in a very large um, format photograph that sort of anchors the exhibition. And it really is a series of different experiences where you connect both with the individual and their story, but also with the objects that were chosen to represent them. Because it's a traveling exhibition, we had many challenges, one of which was we didn't have uh, um, the capacity to take uh, significant historic objects from the main museum collections to travel them to these institutional settings, which were somewhat different, ourselves included. 
we're not a typical museum with climate and, and security conditions that are optimal. So for that reason, we chose a number of objects which were somewhat somewhat representative, but not necessarily anchored in the story of the individual. So they're representing a story without necessarily being associated with the individual. So again, a somewhat hybrid approach in museum studies, where typically you would have an object that belonged to somebody. That's the case in some instances, but not always. A strong feature of the exhibition, of course, are these extraordinary glass works by Toronto sculptor Mark Raines Roberts, who um, also summers in the region here. So has a very good knowledge both of the gardens and of the and of Aveca, but also of the environment, because an English-born a glass artist, Mark has a, his own emotional connection to the first war experience through his own family. So it's kind of combination of of local knowledge, of national historical knowledge, of international historical knowledge, I think brings the exhibition a rather unique poignancy because everybody involved in the exhibition either had a connection or developed a connection over the course of the curation of this remarkable show. The premise that, that Viveka be began with, having found this amazing collection of, of course, Stephen Cantley's works, was to explore the lives of a number of men and women. Uh, we chose individuals that were interesting from a historical point of view, representative to some extent. Here on the left, you've got um, A.Y. Jackson, who's a well-known um, painter associated primarily with the Toronto and Ontario, but in fact was born in Montreal and, and joined the army from Montreal. Uh, you've got George Vanier, of course, who, who whose name is now attached to many high schools across the country, but he was a Canadian soldier of note, diplomat, um, and ended his life as Governor General of Canada. And on the right, you got uh, Ted Savage, who was one of those who not um, who survived the war miraculously, but in 1920 was a victim of the most recent pandemic before this one, which was the great Spanish in influenza uh, pandemic of, of 1919. And uh, Savage died of that in 1920. So we were looking at individuals that were representative of different features, the Jackson, the artist, uh, Vanier, the, the military hero, Savage, the uh, mature sportsman who, who who leads a regiment from Montreal, literally leads his best friends into battle and survives. You have two other representative figures, Talbot Papineau, who was thought to be the Pierre Trudeau of his era. He was rightfully bilingual. He was bicultural. He was as comfortable in French as he was in English. He was the first Rhodes Scholar from Quebec to go to Oxford. He was thought to be the future prime minister of the country and dies tragically in the first war. Um, then you have his good friend and, and 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 colleague, equally same age, wonderful sort of darling of Montreal, Percival Molson, who's now named Grace as the stadium um, of the Montreal Alouettes and the McGill Redmond in Montreal. But in his day, was thought to be an extraordinary leader because of his athletic prowess and and future um, as a lawyer and um, leader of the. Um, of the trust community in, in Montreal. So you have these, these interesting male figures. Um, John McRae, don't need to say much about him. Of course, he's an extraordinary figure who is associated both with Ontario and Quebec because he was educated in um, at the University of Toronto, but then ends up at McGill University and, of course, is best known for his extraordinary poem, but also because of his dedication to duty that leads him to die essentially from exhaustion uh, in 1918. And then you have two representative female figures, none of whom went to battle, but here you have uh, Lady Julia Drummond and her partner in crime, my great grandmother, Elsie Reford, who were um, leaders in their own way. They were battling, as it were, in the home front, but they went very much forward to try and lead the Canadian cause in London to try and bring succor to soldiers as they were being um, brought back to London for two weeks of leave and then sent back to the front, these extraordinarily horrific conditions that. Uh, made many of them uh, suffer from what we now call P PTSD, but was then known as shell shock. In both cases, they suffered, uh, Lady Julia Drummond, particularly because her darling only uh, surviving son was killed tragically um, as, a, as in the early years of the war. And you can almost see engraved in her face her, her deep and dark mourning, this, this event that marked the remainder of her life, but also led her to make duty her badge. And so she was extraordinarily devoted to the war effort, both raising funds for uh, for aid for soldiers, but also leading the battle to try and encourage Canadians to take a greater part in, in the war effort. 
Drummond was unusual, as was Elsie Reeford, in both in, in sort of playing on both sides of the linguistic divide. As we know, the first war was a quite a divisive event in Quebec history. Uh, but both of these women were bilingual, and Guy Drummond in particular was thought to be one of a handful of Canadian officers who could lead his men in other official language. So they're very interesting figures for, for all kinds of reasons, and we chose them because of their uh, leadership. There's a wonderful photograph of Guy Drummond, who was, who was six foot three, very handsome, very, very uh, bicultural, bilingual, um, going, going, um, going to be a great star in Canadian culture and politics, and like many other men, was his life was cut short uh, very tragically in the early years of the war. And there you have one of the many uh, evidences of, of the families who mourn in different ways. This is a beautiful bronze. It's now at the Canadian War Museum of Drummond by the Montreal sculptor uh, R. Tate McKenzie. Elsie referred with my grandfather, Bruce. So it is, to some extent, a family story. We're telling stories that we're connected to in some ways, but I think Viveka's um, drive and ambition as a non-Canadian uh, immigrant was to try and tell the story in ways that were not just about well-known families, but to try and tell stories that would appeal to those for whom the war had no meaning whatsoever. So it's not about Germans versus the Allies. It's not about the biggest battles. It's not about the, the biggest guns and their effect. It really is about the personal connections that these men and women and their families uh, made and suffered over the course of this extraordinary four or five years of conflagration. I'll skip through here quickly just because there's too many photographs and too many things to say, but I'd like you to, to explore the exhibition, each of which has these sort of minute moments of discovery. At the same time, you can sort of see in these minutiae, you can cover to some extent the macro issues, the great lingering and, and, and themes that the first war, of course, becomes well known for. The notion of conflict, you know, what is a what what war is appropriate? When is it just and unjust? Um, the beginnings of the propaganda machines that become very much part of the 20th century 20th century war. This extraordinary um, mobilization of effort, both in terms of munitions and technology, um, and these sort of private moments, like this little medallion that was made for my grandfather by his parents. You can see they were kind of a high-end family because they had a fancy silversmith in London to create this medallion. But this is something that you would have worn around your neck in the event that you were killed at war. This was the kind of badge that would have been used to identify your corpse. So it's a kind of a lugubrious reminder of the proximity of war and how it was very important in this war to know who, who was whom because, frankly, the war um, and the munitions that were being developed um, had a bad habit of obliterating these people into such minute parts that you couldn't identify them. So these kinds of small badges were important um, um, to, to the parental need to connect to the war effort. Here's a good example. My great grandmother in the years just after the war goes on this rather ambitious expedition with a number of Montrealers to see where her friends, children, or sometimes her own acquaintances were killed in the war and literally goes what's called a battlefield tour in these extraordinarily disheartening images taken by my great grandfather of these um, early post-war French and Belgian cities, which are basically obliterated uh, by the war where there's little vegetation of any kind and these extraordinarily temporary crosses that we erected to memorialize these men before these, the extraordinary cemeteries that now dot the landscape where were created. And here you got some good examples of early 19 photographs. So it's a very interesting exhibition uh, for, I can say, with great humility, I think, because it explores the various aspects of the war, it does so in ways which are imaginative, creative. I think it brings the viewer emotionally into the story. It allows you to connect to the stories of individuals. It also tells the story of the war, but doesn't do so in an upfront and uh, to, um, to um, ideological a fashion. Uh, and it does so because we had a great team of, of curators and partners who made this um, exhibition possible. So I do want a brief note of thanks to the many donors who made this possible. It really was a collective effort. We're a small institution that was able to take a, an exhibition to seven different venues. That, that takes a lot of guts, courage, a bit of folly, frankly. Um, but we were able to draw upon the extraordinary generosity of many local friends and partners here, but also our friends at Canadian Heritage and, of course, the museums such as the Living Arts Centre in uh, Mississauga, who had faith and trust and thought that this was a right way to uh, 
to commemorate and to illustrate the Union First War story to audiences across the country. So I want to thank Mrs. Saga for being there for us. Uh, it's been a tough year for everyone in the museum world, so it's a great honor to you to have uh, followed through in your commitment made many months ago to do this exhibition. So I'll, I'll end, I think, uh, with this slide here and pass on the uh, torch to uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, well, I had the honor of seeing the exhibition. I think it was two weeks ago in Mississauga. I happened to be there on my new film in research and I was lucky enough to be able to go and um, I was I was moved, I think, um, which surprises me because this exhibition, I'll be honest, I, I think why well, I, I allow myself here to speak on behalf of of my team. Uh, including Alex, we we never we never thought it was going to be so successful. <laughs> we really didn't. We uh, we created something, um, as we say in in the creative process from within, and I, I think maybe that's the best way to create something: is you create it and then suddenly you you switch on the lights. It all comes together and and it is no longer part of you. You it's it's like birth. You give it to the world and how the world perceives it or how the world approaches it that's that is their right that is their perception that is their history the thing that i i the reason this exhibition started was was truly i i want to pay respects and honor to elspeth angus who passed away unfortunately um a few years ago now elspeth saw the exhibition and and george stephen cantley was elspeth's uh, great grandfather um, and no, sorry, right, Alex's grandfather, excuse me. And Elspeth uh, saw the exhibition from her hospital bed. Uh, she never managed to see the exhibition. She passed away, but she was an extraordinary woman who had kept a box filled with uh, these flowers and letters. Um, and I always say this, when you're making history around a family's story and it's not your story, I believe you have to have consent. You have to have consent and you have to have respect for that family and for that person. Um, and Elspeth saw the narrative that you are looking right now on the screen and, and, and approved. If Elspeth hadn't approved, I probably wouldn't have gone on <laughs> because really it's, it's such a process to give your story or to give your story to, to artists. But I think there has to be an open relationship there um, to understand what, what's going to happen with your family's story. So I wanted to start with this slide because I wanted to just start with how I I, I found this I found Elspeth and and met her and 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 found the box and the flowers and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I, I probably I'll talk about the hardest thing, which is taking a story and handing it over to about forty people and saying here you go let's create an exhibition together. I I want to you know start by with total transparency that I am not a curator. This is my first curating experience. And the best way that I can put that is I am a storyteller because not all stories fit in a film and not all stories are film. I'm primarily a Canadian documentary filmmaker and I have focused on history, but this story couldn't fit in a film. It was an experience that had to have a 360 degree attachment. And that's what we were looking for. However, as Alex mentioned, I was very much influenced by the um, very spoiled nature of a filmmaker, which means that an audience sits in a room and for 80 minutes you listen to a film and you don't leave. Well, hopefully you don't leave, but you sit there and I have sound around you and I have an image and sure you've got popcorn. Well, welcome to curating where you have people walking through an exhibition. They may see 60% of it. Their kid needs to go to the bathroom and everything is and your iPhone's going. So that was the challenge. I, I it took me six months to come up with the narrative of War Flowers. Uh, it really took six months of thinking because once I saw the box and the flowers, and this is going to be a shocker. After 15 years of making Canadian history, it was not enough to have a box of flowers and letters because unfortunately. Uh, we are living in a time where that is not enough for a lot of people to attach them to a story. And my films and my work tends to attach people emotionally because I always start from the premise of what do I know? What do I understand? Now, I am an immigrant from West Africa. I have been through a revolution when I was young. I have been in conflict. I have gone into co countries that have conflict. That is what I know. What I know is human nature in wartime or human nature in revolution in my case. And so I started with that premise 
And also, I had, by the time I came to this project, I'd had the pleasure of working with Alexander and the Reefit Gardens on a number of projects. And Alex and I had long discussions about history and how we, we both love history. But the fact is that the World, World War One is a page in the history books and no blame to the teachers. There's a lot to teach and there's been a lot of battles since. But I was faced with classrooms of students who didn't know anything about World War One and really didn't have an attachment to, to history at all, especially when they were like me and they were from immigrant, they were an immigrant. These 10 names meant nothing to me. I had arrived to Canada and it didn't mean, but what did mean something to me was human nature in wartime. I felt that that hadn't changed. So I'm just going to read the, the this is the central narrative. I hope you have a chance to go to the exhibition. This is what we call the central narrative of the whole exhibition. So I believe that people have an ability to find beauty and hope even amidst the horrors of war. This exhibition e examines human nature in wartime through a series of artistic representations, multi-sensory experiences and portraits of 10 Canadians who were involved in the First World War. Now that paragraph, uh, Alex, we can go to the next slide, please. Did you do that for me? Thank you. So that paragraph is the center point of the exhibition. So I'm just showing you a slide here that is actually a three part slide for a reason. If you look at the top left of the slide, you're going to see what I saw for the first time. This is the English daisy. It's in an envelope with a stamp. The, the pollen has, has left its imprint on the paper. It has a date. It's an amazing document because Alexander who was the historian in our team taught me that we used to throw away the flowers. So it's amazing that this collection had all those pieces, including a stamp date, et cetera. So that's what we started with. And what I did was I took what's called floriography. And floriography is the language of flowers. So in the Victorian era, when somebody wanted to send, wanted to say somebody, say something to someone, and they were shy or they didn't want to express their emotions and it was very contained, they would send an English daisy. They would send lavender and that had a meaning so there is a large dictionary of floriography and what i did was i took the flower and i attached the floriography meaning of the flower so in this case we're looking at the english daisy and the english daisy meant mother's love and so the next slide that you're seeing if you haven't seen the exhibition is what we call a station and it's one of the 10 stations and then the third slide on the bottom right is that we attached the story to Drummond. And so that was that was her story because of mother's love, because of Guy Drummond, who Alex mentioned was lost in the war. So it was a process and I was guided in this process by the Canadian War Museum. When we walked in as a partner museum to the Canadian War Museum, the team was fantastic. Um, and Stacey Barker, the historian there, uh, was amazing. And they 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 basically looked at a filmmaker and said, OK, you've got a great idea here. And they mentored us through this experience, which is very important for anyone who is listening, who has any um, interest in museums and the visitor experience. That moment I talked about where you don't look at your cell phone and you stay with us. It means that when you leave that exhibition, you have maybe felt something. And that was my goal was that we would that you'd leave 25 minutes later and maybe you would understand something that was actually something about yourself in the end. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is actually a, quite a rare picture. This is one of the, the first time we opened the, the letters and flowers. As you see on the bottom right, we have um, these pieces. The flowers were falling apart. They were literally, this was the last time they could be opened. If you look at the paper, the, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, halfway, I think maybe in year two of the exhibition, we got a call from the BBC in the UK who told us that we actually didn't know that we have one of the largest collections of poppies in the world, actually, because this exhibition has one, two, three, I mean, I think there's six or seven poppies in total. And what's amazing is, of course, that the letter, when you see the exhibition, it says Flanders, 1916. So you know that they're from Flanders. So, you know, it's not from anywhere else. Um, one of the nice stories I remember was that when the exhibition went to Vimy, which was amazing for all of us. So they went to Vimy in France and the mayors of the community came out and they were able to tell us because of course, George Stephen Cantley was censored. Apart from Flanders, he couldn't say exactly where he was due to censorship, but the mayors of the towns were able to identify where he was moving around from the flowers. For example, they would say to us, oh, lavender doesn't grow in Vimy or yellow roses grow. So that was quite interesting. They, they were able to identify that. We can see the next slide, Alex. 
please. Okay, so this is very important because this is called the I Believes. Now, when you see the exhibition, you'll see that each station has an I Believe. Each I Believe is attached to a flower. So if you just take the first one, I believe that grief is internal while mourning is public. And that is the poppy. And of course, it's McRae. So the reason that these I Believes are very important to me in particular is that they actually come from veterans. They don't come just from me. Alex had, is a very good writer, and he was the co-writer with me on this exhibition, very poetic. But the fact is that these I believe actually come from years of interviewing Canadian veterans. And so what I had asked them at some point in an interview in some film that I was doing was, what's your lesson? 95 years old, 90 years old, 98, what's the lesson of war? And here are the I believes. Now, for the for the historians in the crowd, the reason we had to put the I believes, which was strongly encouraged, is actually one that's in the middle. And if you look one, two, three, four down, I believe that war is inherent to human nature, as is the desire for victory. That's a very political statement. And if you cannot, you cannot as a, really just say that, it has to have the I believe. So what I had done was in the end, I was taking these I believes and I gave them to the team of artists and the team of artists created what we're going to see a little bit later in my presentation they created from the flower the word whether it was devotion mother's love and this sentence now alexander built a file a history file on each one of of these of the people uh, so that each creator could could really take their story in we say in film that if your film falls apart, it's because your research wasn't good enough. So really, it was very important, the process of making this exhibition. And I followed a process, which is a very Canadian filmmaker process, which is that we go through research and development, we build a very solid research, and then we go into our narrative. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the process, because I am a big supporter of process. I think that in that process, that's when the exhibition becomes. You can start with that slate we just showed you before of a central narrative, but in the end, it's actually that each one of us fed into the exhibition and gave ourselves. That's what really makes it um, very unique, I think. We can go to the next slide, please. So, speaking of the two other artists, Alex and I were writing the texts and the research and having debates over what was important, especially on the day that the Canadian War Museum said you could only write 100 words, which was just very difficult for us to do. But you're looking at one of the stations and what happened from that moment on. As I said, as principal, as the curator, I gave this to Alexandre Bachand and Mark Rains Roberts. Now, when I met Alexandre Bachand, it was on something else, and I had never heard of All Factory. Now, you cannot see in this picture, uh, 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 unfortunately, there's a button just below the photograph um, of Ted Savage, and it, it is the olfactory component of this exhibition, which I can say, having been to the exhibition, is very well run and works with face masks. <laughs> so you actually press a little button um, and a scent comes out. And Alexandre Bachand came up with this whole idea and designed 10 cents of devotion, mother's love, innocence. It's not the scent of the flower. But when we spoke originally on something else, I said to her, I'm trying to surround people with an experience. There's music in the exhibition, there's visual. And she said, well, what about smell? And what's truly, I find truly amazing about this exhibition is that when you smell one of the stations, when you smell, it triggers your own memories. And that's incredible. It's not, it's, it's a part of your, your brain that is actually triggered. So when you're looking at this exhibition here now, you're seeing Mark Rains Roberts Crystal on the right hand side. So Alexandra and Mark and Alex and Normand Dumont, the designer, took the word devotion and we all then built each station together. The frame that you're seeing around Ted Savage is actually from our trip to France in research and it, it's actually shell casing from Flanders. So we actually took that out. Um, there's also in the crystal, in this case, you can't see it very well, but there are maple leaves, there's a bird, because that's all part of the alouette being the bird of the Canadians in the First and Second World War. 
So Mark had taken all parts of Alex's research and he had taken his own experiences and he put it all inside each crystal, which is what makes them quite amazing. And Ted Savage was at Vimy. So when we spoke about Ted Savage, that's why you're looking at a monument style also crystal. This was all parts of, of information that he took in and then came up with the designs. I want to mention the Montreal Botanical Garden because you're seeing an original drawing in the middle that is actually from the Montreal Botanical Garden collection. They partnered with us because as everybody knows, well, history is hard to make and you need your partners. So they actually offered a partnership to us to use these, uh, you know, rights free, these original drawings, and they are wholly responsible with Céline Arsenault for the conservation of these flowers. They, they shared with us a glue that they had created, which is a non-stain glue so that we could glue the flowers to the paper. And let me tell you, there's a funny story in that when we, when we thought, originally thought about doing the, the, conserving the flowers, we were going to put them in glass and heat them. Well, of course we tried it with one leaf and it blew up. So really we were about to blow up a whole bunch of flowers. So then we had to come up with another way to do it. And the Montreal Botanical Garden was amazing. Could we go to the next one, please, Alex? Okay, so I, here I would like to actually talk about the station itself because Alex's photos were lovely and they actually showed, the archives showed how Europe was, was, was rubble. Much of it had been put to the ground. And one of the exciting things about this exhibition is that we went to Europe, we went to France, we stood in the trenches. We, you, I think that's part of the process and I wish that we all had the ability and the funding to do that. So we put that in the process because when we went there, this design was not made, but as you looked up at the cathedrals of Europe, you that this is where these, these concave cathedral type, which is actually, I love it in Mississauga because the stained glass looks like a church. So you're actually standing in a church in these concave, but there was, Normand Dumont is the brilliant designer behind this. Um, and th th these pieces break down into 10 so that the exhibition can travel. Each piece breaks down, but um, okay. So this was the this is the station. It was for two things actually. I remember in the original stories that we wanted to reflect the churches of Europe, but we wanted. I really wanted to talk about faith, because whether somebody was you know Christian or well, Catholic or 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 any other, they, they were looking up at the sky. That was my idea. Was that you were looking up, you were about to go over, and what were you thinking? Again, it comes back earlier to what Elizabeth was saying about me, thank you very much, is that I'm always trying to say, well, in my time, how, what do I understand? How do I feel about this? What are the tools I have? Well, the tools that we have to tell history, we're, we're very spoiled because I have to say, like as a history filmmaker, I have no, when we discover archives or we discover something, it's simply because oftentimes it's digitized now. Like, it's not even, there is no blame or no, oh, well, why didn't you find it before? It's simply very hard to go into every church basement in the world. And if things are digitized, then now us creators can't have more things to work with. Let me go to the next slide, please. Okay, so here is Innocence. This was a, this is a beautiful one. It's, it's the only station that's designed a little bit differently. And I do want to mention this because it comes back to the fact that war has never occurred on, on Canadian soil. And so, uh, Robert Reford, Alexander's grandfather, <laughs> great grandfather, Alex, you're going to correct me, had, um, had taken pictures in Matisse and then in 1918 in Europe. And so when you see the exhibition, you'll see that it has a pointed one side to the other. And it was really that I was saying that the Canadians that went over had never seen any kind of conflict and they were really going into the fray. They were really going to see something that they had never, um, never experienced. And of course, the line on this one is that innocence is the first victim of war. And I love um, the artifact on this. It is a lead bullet, which is actually um, perfect because it only takes one bullet to lose your innocence. Should we go to the next one, please? I wanted to show this one because the crystal that Mark created is astonishing. Um, it's the it's the crystal of healing. Um, it's stitch work is the flower. Um, and one of the things actually that I will mention at this point is that somebody asked me, why is the crystal there? Why is that? Why is it positioned there? Well, it's actually because I love Leonard Cohen and Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. 
And it comes back to the original narrative, which is that I do believe that we have hope even in darkness. Hope is, is springs eternal, as we know. Um, and so that there is a hope that even in all the darkness, the beauty of, of this exhibition is not only Marx's crystal, it's Normand Dumont's design in that he manages to have these rays of light that really reflect in all the darkness uh, some kind of hope and some kind of light. Now, this crystal is astonishing. And when you, when you see the exhibition, I will never forget what Mark said. When he showed me the design on paper, I asked him what had come to him and he said, this is what it's like in the mind of a veteran. And it's truly astonishing. It, it's, there's a man crouching, his shoelaces untied. It's absolutely beautiful. So the next one, please. Yes, the veil of tears, this is mother's love. You see, Mark has carved into the, into the arms, those are arms around the soldier, a mother's arms. And there's daisies, which was the flower of that station. The English daisy is carved into the crystal. And of course, we have a veil of tears. It's absolutely beautiful. They're stunning. The next one, please. I wanted to talk a little about a bit about archives in the exhibition, and I'll wrap up quickly. I think I've probably gone over time. Um, but the archives, they're, they're sort of a, a passion of mine and a bit of a pet peeve, because the fact is that they're not free. Um, and so uh, it's it's a strong politic of mine that I wish archives were free for for artists and museums to use because I feel that we would have more history on the landscape. But this is a beautiful archive. Uh, it's from Vimy, and it was Odette de Zormont, who is a very well uh, experienced, now retired uh, archive visual researcher, and uh, she helped me find all the archives of the exhibition. Um, and this is blown up into a enormous uh, banner. But it, Alex, if you can just go to the next one, I want to show uh, the next one is right. So on the right, you have the 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 station photo for devotion. Um, it's a postcard. The soldier hugging the woman is a tiny postcard. So we, we blew this up into like four feet. It's quite hard to do. Um, but, you know, part of the things that were difficult was, of course, identifying what is devotion. What is grace? Those are those are difficult things to identify. On the left, I find this archive to be quite interesting because what I did try and do is that all the archives in the exhibition are Canadian, uh, except for one. In the healing station, it's a British, it's British soldiers, um, but it's a very strong archive uh, from tear gas. But this archive on the left is quite interesting. After sufficient research with the War Museum involved, this poster was used in the First and Second World War, and it was used across many nations, including under the Canadians. And so um, when we were creating the station Mother's Love, we never thought we would find the greatest mother in the world in a Red Cross poster. So it all came together. And that's um, that's in Julia Drummond's uh, station, Mother's Love. Do we have the next one. I think it's the last one. So this story has is known because it's a, it's a bit of a unique one is that Normand Dumont had been working with me for a long time designing the exhibition was almost ready and suddenly one night I had this dream and the walls were covered in names and there were the names of the of the fallen now I didn't know at the time that this hasn't been done and si since the exhibition has been traveling it's it's been historians who've come to me and say no there hasn't been it hasn't been done that the 68,000 names of those who who died from disease also uh, um, were, were listed. And so we went through a six month process, pulling together from Veterans Affairs and from the War Museum to pull together all the names of those Canadians. Um, many have come to the exhibition in different cities, in Toronto, uh, in Vimy even, and found their family names. So that's been quite moving. Um, as you notice, I decided to not put regiments, titles, they were just human. They were, they were human beings. And I, I was really trying to make an exhibition that was about human nature and about, um, and about how people, how unfortunately, whether somebody was a Syrian refugee who came in Toronto or somebody from the First World War, these conflict emotions and, and ha have not changed. Um, which is not to say that it's depressing. I think it's just human nature. And if we can acknowledge that and attach to it, then maybe we can. Um, my hope is that we can next time we think about engaging in war, 
or next time we send our sons to war and our daughters, the next time we will, we will understand a small fraction of what that sacrifice means. So thank you very much. Vivica, thank you very much. And Alexander, thank you so much as well. Um, I'm very moved <laughs> right now. I've heard you speak a couple times and it just keeps getting better. <laughs> thank you. Um, just looking um, to the Q&A to see if anyone has a question for Alexander or Viveka. Um, don't be shy. Feel free to plot it in there into the Q&A box for us. Um, Viveka, you reminded me um, talking about, you know, today's, uh, for example, refugees from Syria coming to Canada um, and seeing an exhibition like this. Um, I believe you mentioned sort of taking that into consideration while you were creating the the soundtrack for the exhibition. Did you want to share um, a little bit about the the soundtrack and the process that you went through with that and sort of what kind of uh, accommodations you had to make? <laughs> Thank you for rem that's you know um, the, the exhibition is so many pieces and the soundtrack's amazing. It's Marie Claire Sandon is the composer who composed the original music, and uh, Claude Langlois uh, out of Montreal uh, was the sound designer. Now, the exhibition sound, as you go through, I'd love if you could hear it, it's, 20, it's about 25 minutes, and it incorporates every, every part. Again, we come back to the research in Alexander's file. So when he created a file on, um, on, on anybody, if it was, you know, um, Percival Molson, for example, if he created a file in the case of Jean Briand, Jean Briand was a telegraph officer, so you're going to hear uh, the sound of the telegraph, or um, you're going to hear birds because of McRae in his poem talking about the birds above. So Claude Langlois, who's brilliant, and Marie Claire worked together to create that soundtrack. But as as every process goes, um, I was approving things as they went along, and I can't. It's not easy. <laughs> You're dealing with very strong artists. <laughs> they, they may not be curators, but you know they are all in film mostly, and they're very strong and they have good opinions. So I listened to the fir first soundtrack, and there was a sniper in the soundtrack. I literally would have been under the table because that's a sound I know, and it's a terrifying sound, and and it can trigger you. And so as we were, I said to Claude, who was born in Montreal and never been in conflict, I said, Claude, you gotta take that out. So that's not gonna work. You're gonna have people under the table. And so he, he, you know, it's the perception. He didn't realize that. And so we took that out. So yes, we were, it is very hard when you're doing war projects as I do to tell a story, but to really be respectful that you could trigger audiences. And of course we put things, uh, you know, on films, but with this, you have to acknowledge that those sounds could trigger um, somebody who, who you want them to connect to history. You want them to understand and to learn, but you don't want to throw them back into something. We have a question now for Alexander. If you could expand a little bit more on the research and development that took place, as well as um, comments on funding. Um, good question. Well, let me start with uh, with the with the hard one first. Uh, finding money for exhibitions is a, it's it's a tough gig. We were very fortunate early on to get some uh, seed for the Molson Foundation. So they really allowed us to begin the process, the ideation process, the research, the collectivization of efforts to find the right partners and the right people to go to France. So we were very fortunate. They're, of course, a very generous family and, and um, were, were able to, to help us with the start. And that allowed us to make a very solid pitch to Canadian Heritage. It's a super competitive environment. It's not maybe as hard as getting money for films, but uh, the museum world is highly competitive and we're all looking to get funds from a single source, which is the Museum's Assistance Program. And they have a competition every year, November the 1st, and you submit your your best and you sometimes get lucky. And we did, we got uh, the biggest grant that was then available in that program. And that allowed us to pull together the, the iconography that Viveka mentioned that should be free, but isn't. Um, it allowed us to build the stations, which were mobile, another significant challenge to make a, a seriously light, exhibition that can travel from one part of the country to the next, including France and back. 
tough thing. Most exhibitions have a one stop. We had seven, so we can pat ourselves on the back for that. That's a tough gig. And to have the exhibition now still in, in intact is another achievement and, and, and acknowledged um, um, success story for the designer, because that too is tough not to have these things turn into sawdust in one venue or the next. Um, so we were very fortunate. We also had some great partners, some individuals who were generous, some you know, big donations, matching donations from a couple of foundations. Um, we had some supporters, big and small. Viveka is very convincing. Um, she's very good at connecting to people. The, the story, I think, was compelling. So we had you know, descendants of, of fallen soldiers. We had people who had no connection to the story. But we were quite successful in getting private funds, and that allowed us to, to get the matching funds from a couple of very generous foundations. And then, um, of course, you folks and others have been able to access some of the traveling exhibition funds. So it's it's a tough, uh, tough road. And, you know, frankly, we don't have enough money to bring it home quite yet, but that's our challenge in the next couple of months. Um, but that's the funding side. From the research side, you know, there is the challenge for a historian on this field is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of books. Um, and the challenge in the Canadian story is there are not so many books, but there's thousands and thousands of stories. So the challenge, frankly, there was to connect a story, to research it in a way that was verifiable, that was documented, that wasn't completely, um, you know, an imagination on the part of the desired historian, was to connect the right story, to find the right angle, to find the right anecdote, to connect to the objects, to connect to the images. There are some amazing people that we couldn't put in because there was no iconography, for instance. Or we had some amazing photographs, but we couldn't find the story to back up the, 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 the powerful image. So it's a matter of connecting um, the two. Um, I think we made some good choices. We had some tough choices. We probably left out some extraordinary stories. But as Rebecca mentioned, one of the more moving aspects of this exhibition is being to be witness in the various venues and have people come up to you and say, that was my grandfather. Um, you know, I want to tell you his story. And so we had that countless times, these people who wanted to bear witness to the sufferings of their own family. And it was, I think, a nice and important moment for us all, because frankly, every Canadian who had a family member go to war can find their war record online. It's all been digitized. It's an extraordinary narrative. And you can find some amazing stories about people's families. And it's all free. That one's free. It's on the Library and Archives Canada website. So if you have a story that you want to discover, this is an invitation. We have 66,000 names. That's 66,000 different stories, each of which merits being told time and time and time again. So I think our job there was to open the door and not to close it. And I think we were successful in, I think, in, in inviting and encouraging a whole new generation to think about this story as not just about, um, you know, a war of dead white males, but about uh, people who were doing their duty, fighting their fight, but also coming home or not with extraordinary stories that all, all of which merit to be remembered in one way or the other. This is a bit of a technical question uh, relating to the lighting design. So uh, how did you manage the lighting design um, to do both the delicate flowers and make the most of the crystal? And yet it works so well in so many different settings where the atrium is very light and bright and airy, but in other um, galleries like Chateau Ramsey, you had a very different lighting palette. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, the, the concept, as you hopefully will attend and see, it's sort of a meditative process. When you go into War Flowers, it's almost like I said, going into a church and it's, it's a meditation. And this, again, I give full credit to my training in film. So in film, when you, when you ask a question in an interview, you actually ask it in three levels. And so the lighting is reflecting what I'm talking about. So the first level of question is, what's your name? The second level of question goes a bit deeper. And the third is where you actually, we believe you actually ask, you've actually gained the trust of somebody to take them, to ask them that question at that level. Well, that's the lighting of the exhibition. The exhibition has the crystal lighting is meant to be, it's an optical crystal. It's the, it's the highest quality crystal. So it's meant to have a ray of almost like, as I said, of light reaching up to the, to the heavens. The flowers, it's a very good question about the flowers. We have always kept a dim lighting on the flowers. 
but this is the sad reality of, of an exhibition. It can't go forever because those flowers need to be in a protected. It, and we all know in museums, the longer that that archive and artifact is out, the longer it's it's degrading. And so they need they need to go to bed now. It's time for them to rest. But yes, we have always kept very soft lighting on the flowers and we we focused lighting. So as you go through, there's a different scheme. And as you stand in the cocoon of the of the arch, it's almost like you are under a light. You're you're in your own world. And so that's how I sort of saw it. We went to three levels of connection. I think we have one last question. Um, so, Vecca, you've talked about how you enrich the exhibits with stories and photos, the actual words or voices along with the stories. Can you elaborate more on that? Just to be sure I understand the question. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think I quite understood the question. It's, it's how did we use voices in the soundtrack? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, from what I understand, uh, just a little bit more discussion on um, how you took the individual elements and created um, the 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 dialogue voices along with the stories. Oh, if that person can would like to clarify their question, it might be easier. I'm interpreting you now. <laughs> I can say, I mean, for now, while we wait perhaps for someone to answer, but um, I can say for now that what's really important is to always stick to your, um, here, here comes my, my learning from the Canadian War Museum. You have a narrative of devotion or mother's love, and then you have the I believe, and then you have the individual story. You have to remain connected always to devotion, which is what Alex, I think, was saying about all the elements if you in your narrative arc if you stay with that with that major then anything can move around it because of course in ted savages like what alex and i did was that we went through the ten. we had the 10 flowers we had the 10 words but who was innocence who was grace now why was papineau grace well grace is actually about involvement quebec had a political discussion around the war around conscription. So it's all in there. It's around grace. It's your decision to get involved. So it is a, it's a narrative that has a lot of depth, but it, it is actually about keeping the focus on that, that word, which is why Alexandra was creating with many elements involved, the scent of that word, every element went, I mean, it's amazing. If you, if you smell the scent of innocence, Jean Briand was from the regions of Quebec. And you can literally, she put, I remember she put the smell of fresh grass because that's what the regions are, they're this, these rolling hills. So every element, if that answers the question, every element of your experience in that story is taking you back to that, that person or that, that word. Thank you, I think you did a great job. The comment was very helpful, thanks. So I think, I think you were terrific. <laughs> Wow, everyone, thank you so much. Um, just past eight o'clock here. Um, and I, I will just mention, we've got a, a last comment that came in that was really great. And then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, the comment is as a guide for War Flowers in 2017 and having followed it at the different venues, I've been amazed at its ability to adapt to the different venues and still bring the strong connections to the experiences that you are portraying. Um, and we've got a lot of people in here as well saying bravo and thank you all. And really this has been uh, such a wonderful experience for us to hear from you firsthand. Um, your, your experiences with um, with creating this exhibition and all that you put into it. So um, thank you, Viveka and Alexander, for your time here tonight. Um, thank and, and thanks for, 
just being so gracious and generous um, with your information. Um, there's so much more to see. You've got so much wonderful content as well. Um, you can visit the uh, museum's website. It's mississaugaculture.ca slash warflowers. Um, so I really encourage our attendees to please check out that website, miss, uh, mississaugaculture.ca slash warflowers. We've got lots more speakers coming up and lots of great content still to explore um, from this exhibition that Viveka and Alexander produced. So um, thank you again so much for your time thank this you. evening. Thank you. Okay. Take well, care, everyone. So Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.